Welcome back to Ty and That Guy. I'm Wes Chatham. This is my good pal, Ty Frank. Yeah, and today we're talking about episode 509, Winnipesaukee, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, which was directed by Breck again, because we can't seem to get rid of that guy. And uh, this one was written by me and Daniel and Narain Shankar, because it took three of us to write this masterpiece. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, God, I, I hate giving you compliments, but this is my favorite episode of the season. Okay. And the, I mean, and I hate to give Brett compliments too, but the shootout in 509 is so badass. And, you know, the fact that it's one continuous shot, I mean, I don't think we've done something that long in the expanse so far. So, uh, you know, Brett did a good job. You know, hopefully he never listens to this, but uh, yeah, he did a really good job. Yeah, no, it turned out okay. Uh, it was uh, as, as technically challenging as the shoot was for that. Um, I think the, the product, the final product is going to work really well, or does work really well. It's going to work really well for fans too. And what else is going on 509? So uh, we're getting the mysterious messages from Dom, from Naomi. We're getting the messages. Yep. Uh, we see uh, Steven and the Rasanane trying to figure out what's going on. We see Alex and and Bobby headed that direction, trying to figure out what's going on with, with, uh, with Na- Naomi. Yeah, we got Avasarala dealing with some heavy political stuff uh, up there on Luna as, uh, as the government of Earth tries to respond to uh, the Free Navy attacks. So she's got uh, a lot going on there. Oksana tells uh, Drummer that Naomi is alive, that she believes Naomi is alive. Yeah, yeah, big moments, uh, and and all that all that stuff with Drummer in in this episode, uh, building up to what is going to be an explosive uh, climax for the season. So I'm very excited. This is we're 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 moving toward the end game here, and it's uh, it's getting pretty exciting. Now, explain to me what exactly is Naomi going through right now on the Chess of Mocha? What is she accomplishing? What is she trying to accomplish? Yeah, so she's she's got a couple of different things that she's trying to do here. She's trying to communicate. She she has no radio to uh, to call out. Uh, we see um, earlier she you know she tries to build a microphone for herself. It shorts out. She can't. She's having trouble uh, sending any messages out. She's she's communicating by taking the pre recorded message and and shorting it out at specific points to change what the message means by shorting out. Uh, certain words so she's got that going on um you know she's also trying to figure out how to to get some control of the ship how to steer the ship um yeah i mean there's and and uh the other thing that's happening here is every time she uses the the airlock to go between the holes she loses all of the air that's in that airlock which is why she's making those marks on the wall because she's calculated how much air she has in the ship and how much she can afford to lose to do this work. So she's, she's got this running clock in her head of, I can only go outside so many times before I'm out of air. And if you notice every time she comes back in, she's a little more exhausted because there's just a little less air in the ship. She's, you know, she's getting uh, oxygen deprived and, you know, dying of thirst and yeah, she's got a lot going on. Naomi's having a, Naomi's having a a bad day. And then you have Avasarala, and she is trying to avoid mass, casual, mass casualties and, and trying to, to talk them out of attacking Ceres. Yeah. Um, poor Ceres, man. <laughs> that, place <has> been, <laughs> that place has been through it, you know. Um, is this, would you say, is this season one Avastrala making the, do you think season one Avastrala would be making these decisions? Or obviously this is somebody that's been affected by the death of her husband who has grown and who's, has the experience that she has where she's making a decision that seems a bit different than well, we've, the old we've talked about. I mean, we've talked about this before. Uh, Avasarala has a long arc in our show, you know, in, in, in episode one of season one, she's hanging belters on hooks and talking about earth must come first. Exactly. Um, this is an Avasarala who's been through a lot, who's seen a lot, who's been forced to confront uh, you know, I mean, she, she, she was on the Rossi for a while. She was hunted by her own government for a while, you know, when Aaron Wright tried to have her killed. Um, has become close friends with Bobby Draper, a Martian who was her 
you know, uh, the Martians were their enemies for most of her life, um, who's been forced to confront what's happening in the belt and to the belters. Um, she's grown as a human being. She's got a different perspective. And when the government wants to respond to Marco's attacks on Earth by attacking civilian populations in the belt, she's not a person who can do that anymore. She's, you know, she, she has to argue against that. She, you know, she's talking about like, hey, they killed a bunch of our children. Maybe the response to that is not to go kill a bunch of their children. Maybe that's not how we fix what's happening. Is Marco, our role model now. Great yeah, line. exactly. Such a great line. Yeah, is Marco our role model? I mean, that's a that's a Daniel Abraham line. I mean, it's it's I can hear it coming out of his mouth. Is 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 is, is when somebody punches you in the face. Um, yes, one of the options is to punch them back in the face, but is that always the best option? Is that always the right option? Is that the is that the best way to de-escalate the conflict and and find a way a path to peace? Um, and it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, she's grown. Yeah, and it's interesting that Michael Irby's character is now motivating this because of the shame and the guilt that he has because he didn't act when he knew that he should have. And so now he's being driven by pure rage and, and revenge and the shame from the decisions that he didn't make early on. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think some of it is that. I think some of it is that, that shame, that embarrassment. But I also think that, you know, I mean, he's an admiral. Uh -huh. he's, a, he's a military man. Uh -huh. uh, and... You know, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? I mean, he, here's, here's, here's a problem he thinks he can solve. Bad guys are trying to kill us. We know where they are. Let's go kill them instead. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, you can, you can see how uh, uh, that it, the military perspective on this becomes very clear. And we pick up where uh, Amos and Clarissa are kind of on their Hail Mary plan to get out of, <laughs> get off this, this blue rock. And, uh, and try to make it. And, and Clarissa tells them about this island that they used to spend the summer on and that the, a bunch of very wealthy people and they have sh a lot of them have shuttles that they keep that can uh, that gets lunar ca Luna capable. Um, and uh, and Amos is joined with his old pal Jacob uh, to use his resources, but also to have an extra an extra muscle to get there and to help them through protection. And so we pick up right where they are. And, uh, and this also brings us to our very special next guest, Nadine Nicole, who's going to join us to talk about 509. Hey, Nadine. Hey. Are you in LA right now? I'm at my mom's in Michigan in the basement. It's so cold. I have my little blanket. But how fitting. I mean, you know, I was, we uh, talked a little bit uh, last episode about us working in the frozen tundra north of the <laughs> wall in the, in the middle of a Canadian winter. And being stuck out there, I mean, it was so. That's probably the coldest I've been in my. You were life. a champion. You, you were. were oh, I kept going inside and hiding with my little like warm packets everywhere. I was I, we did. We did try very hard to make uh, Wes take his clothes off. As well. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, one of the things that I really, uh, I really enjoyed about Five Hundred Nine is just. We're finally at we're finally at this place. We finally found a shuttle. We're finally putting these things together. Things are happening, and then Clarissa invites all these people to come <laughs> join us. And then at the end, uh, and then you know, then you have the security team uh, that was coming and trying to shake us down. And Clarissa stops us from killing them. And then you know, and, and I think it's uh, I think it's I think it's great because it's really showing how much Clarissa has grown and what she's trying, the person that she's trying to be. And she's kind of got me in a little bit of a spot because I told her what Lydia was to me and how he's trying to be a person. And it's like, God damn it. You know, she's using my, my logic against me. And, and uh, so I, I find that struggle humorous and, and fun to watch uh, for them trying to leave uh, the island. Totally. I love 509 because it's where we get the payoff you know, watching their relationship. It's where we finally kind of start seeing why, like why they're on this journey together and how they're affecting each other and their growth. Um, so it's really special. We get that at the, the end of the series. Amos did too good of a job uh, telling Clarissa how to be a better person because now she's actually doing it. Now Clarissa is actually being a better person. It's kind of pissing Amos off. It was like, it's like, not, not now. Don't be a good person now. We'll be a good person later. <laughs> You know, and, and she uses my own words against me when uh, when we're the security teams there 
And and it's like, God damn, you, they're coming back. You know they're coming back, but you know, you're right. All right, we're gonna do it this way. What words was that with pink water? I, I don't, I mean, whatever you said to me is- <laughs> Enough people have died already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, maybe it's not my own words, but my own reasoning about, you know, that you can't, you don't have to be a good person to do good things. And, and, yeah. You know, I, I, for me, I, the, I think the thing that resonates the most in this episode and, and in their relationship is the early conversation where he was talking about, we're a tribe of two. You know, the tribes have gotten small. We're now a tribe of two, uh, you know, way back uh, a couple episodes ago. And Clarissa really seems to have taken that to heart because when she's talking to Eric, she's saying, no, we're growing the tribe right now and we're better because we have and we're stronger because we have. And wouldn't the world be a better place if, if we were all in the same tribe and we didn't have to justify why we're there? We just, everybody accepted everybody else, whether they were, you know, considered important or not. And and you can and what you can see through this episode, I think, and Nadine, please chime in uh, your perspective on it. But what I think you see is Nadine trying to fold everyone into the tribe. You know, all those all those people who are trapped on the island. Okay, you're part of the tribe now. You're coming with us. You know, the the pink water people show up, and she's like, No, no, we don't have to shoot each other. We could all be on the same team. Um, and I think that's where that's where Amos's words to her now is starting to come back to haunt him because she's going, I agree with you, Amos. We should all be in the same tribe. And now everybody's in her tribe. Yeah. I really love that scene with Jacob, um, Eric in the shuttle. And I think it's so cute because she's being real and she's trying to figure it out, but I think she has a point. And at the same time, it kind of comes off as like ludicrous, right? <laughs> it's kind of both. Um, and then at the end being like, well, yeah, he's like, where did, uh, Amos find you and just in prison for multiple homicides <laughs> Try and work it out. Um, and then with pink water, I think Clarissa knew she kind of messed up. I mean, going off of emotions and adrenaline in that big scene, in that moment, she did what she thought was right. But after everyone kind of told her what was up, I think she knew that she kind of messed up. But if she didn't, we wouldn't have the big shootout. So it all works out. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, that conversation that you have with Eric, what I think is interesting about that conversation is it's very similar to the conversation that I have with you after we pass the man that's sitting by the fire and I'm and I'm watching to see if he's coming. And you were like, you're like, that guy's not going to be a threat to us. And then I'm and then I explain to you everything that you think you knew about society. And it, it's not the same anymore. The rules are out the window. And I understand it because this is how I grew up and this is what the world looks like when everybody's just trying to survive. And that's the same thing that Eric was saying to you when you guys were sitting in that cockpit and, and, and him and I, because we, uh, were, we were friends and we had to survive together. We have that same outlook, that same point of view. So one of the great things about going to find Eric and us being in the journey together with me and Eric is we both know how to survive. This is something we know how to do. We don't really know how to live in the other world that well we know how to live in this world and so we work well together and it's almost like there was the scene of two the, the two angels on one side you were on one side and he was on the other when all of the summer uh the the summer employees uh were there and they wanted to get on the ship and he goes <laughs> he goes we have no room so fuck off you know and like just completely and then you're like what are you talking about you know and then because when he says it you know, you see Amos be like, yeah, 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 sorry, we don't have no room. And then you're like, no, 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 we got to save these people. And so it's, he's got both people on both sides, his new life and his old life. And they're in their own and going in a tug of war in the middle. And I love that conflict of knowing that, you know, Clarissa needs Amos. She needs Amos and Eric to survive, to go on. Who would she be? What would she do? You know, she's this... Um, uh, from prison and she has nowhere to go. She wouldn't survive. So she knows she needs you guys, but at the same time, she's willing to go up against you and what you want and believe to try and do what's right. Um, but then she's kind of like taking you with her. I think there's a, the beautiful transformation and journey that people are going to be really excited about for Amos. I think it'd be pretty surprising. Yeah. 509, man. I mean, that's, it's just such Still a great episode. And then, you know, and then we could talk a little bit about the shootout, you know, I mean, the, the amount of preparation that went into 
I mean, the amount of extras and squibs and I mean, when, when the shootout starts, and I want people to understand this, it is one continuous shot all the way till we get to the shuttle. And so it starts and we're in that pit in that front yard and the shooting starts there. So all of that was a coordinated effort with squibs, with people dying at the right time, right in front of the camera, having explosions happen at the right time, coordinated with going, I mean, the, I'm telling you, you know, one of the, the great things about working with the Expanse crew for six years is, I mean, not many crews or not a, a DP or whatever could pull off something as difficult or technical as this. And that location was awesome. It was some kind of um, wind tunnel where they tested hurricanes on cars or some kind of epic building that was mm -hmm. creating like hundreds of mile per hour winds. So it was this great space to work in and Breck rocked it. I remember it was so loud when you guys were shooting and it was like 3 a.m. and I was <laughs> sleeping on some boxes in a corner, like trying to get some sleep. It was just like everyone's wearing those uh, soundproof uh, headphones and it was so much fun. I, I remember I remember hearing how much time we had to shoot the shot and then we did a walkthrough and rehearsal and the walkthrough just kept going and going and going and going. And then, I mean, I was at, I was at a point where I was like, I, I don't think we could... I don't think this is going to happen. I don't think that we have enough time to get through it. And somehow we did and how we pulled it off. And it was, a, it was a, it was a challenging shoot. I mean, it was a, it was definitely a, a struggle to get it done on time. And I remember at one point, Jacob, who plays Eric, who's fantastic in this, by the way, Jacob, if you're listening, so good as Eric, but I remember, you know, it was about 4:30 in the morning and the sun was about to come up and everybody was just freezing and we were trying to get that long shot in one go and i saw him just staring at a wall just kind of like spaced out and I, and i was like jacob i, I said jacob what's going on and he turned and goes i'm holding i'm barely fucking holding on man and then he just <laughs> got up and went back to one and then he did it he did it he did this amazing take you know afterwards and he hit it and he pulled it together but we laughed at we laughed at that for so long. I mean, good game. oh yeah, I remember that. And you and Amanda were having an interesting time getting that last shot where you're pulling her into the shuttle, like that oh, last yeah. thing with those those gun shoots and those blanks. Like there's like three. I remember everyone counting like one, two, three. What what I don't remember. Yes, I, yes, I remember that. Yeah, I think because because we shot so many times uh going forward so the, just keeping up with the continuity of how many times you shot and yeah. even in the scene you've been seen and you're shooting you're like god damn it, i shot four times and i only supposed to shoot three i know this take is going to have to start all over again uh yeah it was pretty pretty and there were some there were some interesting technical challenges there too because for the first time ever on our show we used actual guns firing actual blanks yeah um where every other time we've used digital effects as uh as the gunshots and that adds a whole other level of thing i mean we can if, we, if we're doing it digitally we can put the shot in wherever we want basically um but with the with the blanks you will run out of those if you do it wrong or you know you every reset you have to reload the gun and the armor has to take the gun and reload it and make sure it's safe um it just all of those things add a lot of time to the process yeah i mean the armorers like to be able to keep track of every gun, all the ammo, who's shooting what, how, and it's all different ammo. It's all different calibers that we're shooting. Yep. And then uh, also keeping track. And then when the scene resets, they got to take all the shells off the ground and then put the snow back in, in the right way. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I said earlier, Nadine, I don't like to compliment Breck, but he did a really good he job. He did a good job. Well, I, yeah, I mean, and, and give Brett credit for sure, but the, the entire crew uh, that uh, when you do a, a when you do a technical shoot like that, um, you have to have the entire crew humming. I mean, because the you know, the people are putting the, the snow, you mentioned the snow. That's not the armors. That's that's the locations crew that are getting the snow back to where it's supposed to be. And then you've got the armors that we've already talked about. And then you've got Jeremy and the camera team, you know, the, those guys having to make sure everything is shot correctly. You know, you can't screw that up. And then you've got all those, you know, we have those people up in the hills with the, the muzzle flashes up there that had to go off at exactly the right time. 
You know, I mean, there's, uh, there's so many moving parts in a technical shoot like that. It's hundreds of people doing exactly the right job at exactly the right time. It's astonishing every, anything ever gets done. And then you think about, I mean, think about wardrobe, think about Joanne and, uh, and Lindsay and what they had to keep up with because when it squibbed and the, first of all, the, the wardrobe is amazing on this show. The, 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 Joanne and the staff and everybody's just the best. But you have the outfits, they blow up, they got to have a replacement and get the squibs in there right away. And you're talking, I mean, how many extras would you say? I'm, I, I don't think hundreds an exaggeration. I mean, you have dozens, dozens. Okay. Maybe yeah. it <laughs> you have dozens and dozens of extras that are getting shot and you got to re clothe them. You know, they got to, you got to take that off, put the new outfit on, put the new squibs in. And so I just, I just want to make a point at how the crew, how phenomenal the crew is and how technical that long shootout and what went into it to be able to, to, to make it look the way it did and to last the way that it did, uh, how much, how, you know, the great work that everybody did. And apparently we had Nadine hiding behind some boxes and sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we were disturbing your sleep with it. Shootout, when we were at that house, that beautiful mansion up uh, north, um, I actually saw it on the good place. And I was like, oh my God, we shot there. And it looks totally different because they did it in the spring and there's a lake there. Um, but everyone was outside. All of the hundreds of crew are outside in like Arctic gear where it's negative 20 and like wardrobe, what you said, they're putting heating pads on everyone because the actors aren't dressed for Arctic gear. We're dressed in our wardrobe. So they're layering us with all these hot pads everywhere and checking on us every take and putting us in tents with warmers. And they're doing that for all of the crew. Um, it was just a really big undertaking. And especially remember that rig with that light that lit the entire house. That thing was pretty epic. Did you know uh, when you first got involved with Expanse or when you first uh, read about the part, did you know that it was going to have the life that it did? Were you familiar with the stories at all? Did they no. let you know ahead of time? No. When I got Clarissa Mao, the audition, I got one scene. And it was in prison when the pastor comes up to her and says, um, you know, we have a little scene there and Clarissa's in prison. And there was no uh, backstory. There was no what's happening, how she got there, who that is. And so I had no idea what was going on. One of the only auditions that I just threw it down three times, sent the first one. And I had no idea what was going on in that scene. No clue. Had a read the books. And so I had no idea that it would be such an epic journey for Clarissa and she would have such a beautiful arc in her transformation and in her journey. It's been so much fun. I've always, always wanted to do action. And this is the first time I really got to do it. Yeah. You get to, uh, you know, for all we talk about Clarissa, you know, learning to be a better person this season, uh, she does get to get her murder on a few times. That's <laughs> <laughs> true. Exactly. Clarissa just can't seem to escape that. <laughs> you do it in a major way in uh, episode six. I mean, you uh, you tear that guy apart, and then you you have that. And I don't even think I don't know on the day that uh, tiger sound that you hear. <laughs> that's her. I and I remember. <laughs> I remember sh when we were shooting that scene, and and you going off and doing the tiger sound. I was like, are they doing? Is that sound? Of, where is that voice coming from? It was like. <laughs> Like just like the claw. I mean, it sounded like a tiger. It just happened. It just came out. And it just <laughs> yeah, everybody kind of looked at each other and was like, "What the?" Hell was <laughs> I do remember that. And then we had a lot of killing with pink water. They tried coming in from the side right before we left, and then you got yeah. Well, during you killed all of them. Well, you killed like nine people. Yeah. So that that led to my favorite bit of ADR I've ever written. So, you know, I mean, one of the things you do as a producer when the when the episodes are cut together, when you have a final cut of an episode is you find all the places where you need to, you know, put additional dialogue or whatever. And uh, w there was a space there where we needed to get some dialogue and we needed some dialogue from Jacob. So it's it's where you guys go through and Clarissa is sort of slumped on the ground and she's surrounded by corpses. 
and she's covered in blood and they're helping her up. And I just I wrote a line of dialogue for Jake, Jacob. He goes, remind me to be a lot nicer to her from now on. I love that. <laughs> I remember that yeah. The big question for me for, for Nadine uh, in this season, um, because it, so this is this is really kind of the end of this story. So I think we can talk about the whole arc, right? I mean, there's no reason to just stay entirely on nine. When we find Clarissa, you know, in I, I think it's episode. Yeah, it's episode four where uh, Amos goes to meet her in prison, right? Is that four? I think it is. Yes. Yeah. Um, she seems very defeated. You know, when she tells him, she says, you can't help me. What, what are you here to help me? You can't help me. Not every stain comes out. By the time we, we catch up, you know, we find them again in nine, you know, after, after that, those multiple episodes of, of her journey. What, what, as, as a performer, what, what do you think? What, what were you digging into to get her to the place where she is in nine, where she's, she seems almost rejuvenated, where she's, I, she seems to have like a different uh, idea of what her life can be. And she's talking about growing tribes and she's talking about being good to people and, and that kind of stuff. How, how did you get her from that defeated person in four, the person who goes, not every stain comes out, you can't help me, to what we see her become in nine? Like, what, as a performer, what, what, were you, what were you digging into to get to that place? That's an amazing question. I think oh, there's so much behind it. And I got a lot, actually, from the books, uh, the audiobook, reading it. Because when what you don't see is her time in jail and the uh, psychological state that she goes through. So she goes, in the books, she goes through huge epiphanies and revelations about why she did what she did. Um, how she doesn't deserve, you know, to have a second chance. Like she, she goes through all of the wrongs that she's done and realizes she's been put in her place. But when Amos comes and she, and they go through this catastrophic event and then all of a sudden she's free. I mean, there's a new hope, there's a second chance and she has a, like a new friend, you know, someone to support her and kind of like lift her out of that space. And I think leaving prison and having the freedom to try and live another life just gives you that opportunity to move forward. And um, all the revelations that she had of, of the person that she was and the family and her dad and, and kind of really just coming to reality with everything put her in the position to look at the staff members in episode nine and be like, oh yeah, like we need to help these people. We're not gonna, you know, the rich families are not gonna help them, which she never would have done before. She was still in the position of the world she was living in. And now as Wes said, that's crumbled and gone. The status is completely irrelevant. So um, I think it's just kind of the combination of understanding what happened to Clarissa's psychology from the books, which was so helpful, um, you know, with the chance that she's got to be free with Amos and have, yeah, just a better run at it. It's interesting because I felt like I've, I felt that first moment when you're out of prison for the first time and you're feeling the wind blowing and you're laughing. Uh, and I think you're crying, but you're really laughing. And it's like that realization that all this, not only is that prison gone, but the prison that the expectations of who I am, my last name, my family structure, all that's gone too. So even yeah. though this is the one of the worst points in the, in the history of the world, for you personally, it's, you know, it's el elation. It's like, you know, a, a, a freedom that you've never felt before. And, and she was drugged up before you know yeah. so and she was really in this like kind of psychotic state so once that kind of cleared out as well it's just easier to lift yourself up mentally i don't know what do you think you wrote it Ty. <laughs> <laughs> you know it, the, the thing that i find fascinating about this process you know when i write books um when you know when daniel and i put out a novel uh that's just us. And, and the, the performers of novels are the readers of novels, but we're not there when they do it. We're not inside their head when they read it. So we don't get to see how they perform it. When you're writing scripts, of course, obviously there's, there's another element. There's a performer. And the thing I find interesting about that process is, is, you know, you put words on a page, the performer brings a whole other huge raft of things to that. Uh, there, there's so much more that goes into what is on screen than just the words I put on a page. There is 
there's the performer's idea about where that character is and their backstory that they've created in their head and, and, and the mental state that they think the, the, the character is in and how they try to portray that. All of that stuff goes into it. And I don't have any control over that and, and shouldn't have any control over that because that's the beauty of the collaboration between a writer and a performer, you know, an actor that, that I, I, I can put words on a page and, and you're going to bring a whole lot of other stuff to that. Um, and, and, and that collaboration is, is when it works well, it is the strength of the medium. So I'm Thank always curious. I ask those questions because I'm very curious. Yeah. You as a performer, I, I know the words I put on the page, but you brought so much more than that. And I'm always curious where those extra things come, came from. You know, what, what you were drawing on to get that extra material oh, in there. Yeah. Well, I've gone through a really deep healing journey in my own life that I'm just so grateful for. Um, and very aware and in tuned with and connected to. And so I, it's so easy to apply that to Clarissa. Clarissa just goes like into the, the collective butt of that. And um, it's, it, it's, it's just easy to understand for me. Um, but I remember on set, I think we were like maybe in the elevator shaft, maybe we were shooting episode five. And I remember you kind of turning to me being like, Clarissa is one of my favorite characters. I, I you know, <laughs> her like, and on this this journey, I'm really trusting you with this part. I'm like, thank you. So I just, yeah, thank you for your trust. You know. Damn, Ty, you couldn't have waited till after the. After the <laughs> 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 a little pressure on the shoulder. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I, I have a lot of, uh, I have a lot of sympathy to the Clarissa character. Um, there's a. There's a version of me. I, I, I see a version of me. It's not the one that I am, but I, there's a version of me that has spent some time in prison. Um, and and I, I, I see that I, I, there were moments where I made choices and I absolutely see the other choice I could have made. I, I'm so aware of that other choice and, and the version of me that would have wound up coming out of that choice. And so, uh, what, you know, when I see people dealing with... Um, the mistakes that they've made. Uh, it's very easy. If you haven't made those mistakes, it's very easy to go, well, that person's just stupid or they, you know, they're just a terrible person. Um, I, I think, I think maturity is realizing how close you came to those same mistakes yourself and the, and the empathy that comes from that. Um, so I, I've, I've always had that relationship with Clarissa that I'm very empathetic to her and, and how family can screw you up and how family can, can make you do things you wouldn't have thought you were capable of doing. Um, and, and the regret that comes from choices um, that, that you can't ever take back. You know, there's the terrible thing about choices. There's this time only goes one direction. So there's this awful finality to everything. Uh, and, and this brings me to the next thing I was going to ask about, because one of my favorite scenes is not in this episode. It's in an earlier episode where you guys are in the cabin together. And Clarissa says, I'm scared all the time. I'm scared of, of the choices that I made and how right it felt when I was making them. And that really speaks to a, a personal fear of mine that in the moment you can feel absolutely right and justified in the choices that you're making. And only in hindsight will you realize how wrong you were. And by then the damage is done. And, uh, and watching Clarissa deal with that and, and accept that and say, I, I thought I was so right. And looking back, I realized I was so wrong. And that, and that is a terrifying thing because now every choice I make from now on is going to be in the shadow of that. No matter how right I feel, well, still, I'm going to have that fear. Yeah. That's, that's exactly. fascinating. You know, whenever, you know, if you, whenever you see uh, or, or, or see an interview or somebody that's been in prison for something they did when they're 18 and now they're, they're, an, they're an old man now and they talk about, and then you think about, you know, to your point, Ty, you think about the decisions that we made 17 or 18 and it just happened to, it happened to turn out okay, or it didn't, it didn't have the biggest impact that it could have had. And you see this person and they're, they are completely different human being than who they were when they were 18. Yeah. And one choice has changed their whole life. And that is terrifying. And that, and I think that's why Clarissa's story is resonates with so many people because if you were in those circumstances and you had those social pressures and you had that same father and you were desperate for the love of that father and you behaved in the way that seems completely and totally justified and makes sense. And then now you have an awakening later in life and, you know, 20 years, 30 years from now, I mean like, wow, I was so wrong. I was so hypnotized by the world 
And that's that great line that Amos says is that the world is messed up and sometimes it messes you up. And that's, you know, basically he's, you know, he's saying that this, your cir circumstances, your situation has driven you to make the decisions that you made, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's who you are. And you can take that off. People relate to Clarissa because of all of that. Like people love the, the arc, the, the, the conquering of the suffering of the fear of that, like, you know, getting through it. I like the throwback to your sister too in 509 when she says uh, you and your sister were fighting the whole time. Yeah, yeah. I know. Cause you don't, you don't see Julie in this story and her dad and her father. And it's so nice to go back to that family psychology and remember the backstory. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, tune in next time. Where we'll be talking about 510, the last tie in that guy after show for season five. Uh, please like and subscribe down there and uh and thanks for coming to hang out with us yeah thank you nadine for uh wasting your time with us today thanks for having me it's so good to see you guys look at this this is what it's like working on a studio